world, and she became the crucible through which um, I saw the art world. And so we began to make art together. This is in our basement in Vermont. Um, just playing with color, again, very free and informed by the visual world of, of Sam Gillian and color interaction. But then I had this aha, you can see we're working safely on my table saw. And, uh, <laughs> I realized I could cut up our art and then join it back together in um, really fun ways. And so my daughter and I made a, you know, started making Mother's Day gifts and things like that, just as father-daughter stuff. Um, and that was my first aha. Um, that work was both incredibly therapeutic for myself, but it was also incredibly social with this young person. We sort of really connected at an emotional and a core level. So I thought to myself, well, wow, maybe I can package this process up and bring it to more young people. So uh, we started this thing called the Peace Piles Project, really just making collages on eight by eight wood panels. Sam worked on wood panel. I came to learn it as a fantastic medium for painting and expression, and so adopted it. Um, folks started making incredible art, and they wrote incredible things about the art that they were making. And I thought to myself, there needs to be a way to scale this so more people can participate. So I had the second aha, which was, oh, this is social practice art. And that's where I began to learn about social practice um, art. So um, my family happens to work in global health. HIV AIDS uh, was very much at the top of the global health agenda for a good two decades. Um, I began to wonder, can this thing I do in the arts over here somehow be used to support um, AIDS awareness, AIDS advocacy efforts? So we created this thing called the Global Peace Palace Project to engage young people around the world. One minute. One minute, thank you. To uh, produce art that responded to their context. We created card games, study guides, etc. We also created an online app where we could upload uh, the young people's artwork. People could make their own murals and then share them. This idea of peer education and self-advocacy is really what motivates me today as an artist. We hit about 20 countries, had exhibits in eight of them. This is what the workshops looks like. This is what their artwork looks like. And one of the things we began to do was combine their artwork um, to make mosaics that referenced one another. So it became a very much a globally socialized um, language through these peace tiles. And we had exhibits around the world, brought them to the world's top policymakers, um, with really the goal of bringing young people's voices to where the policy decisions were being made that affected their lives around the global HIV AIDS pandemic. Five insight, or four insights, zero social right. engagement, personal expression, fair education, and community agency. That's what I go for. Okay. <laughs> Art, community and design. I'm a fine art trained artist uh, that 
Also, he's been trained as a graphic designer and illustrator, so I bring all of those skill sets together to create murals. And I've been doing that now for about six years or so. Call me from the studio practice has become really a social practice for me to work on murals because what I love is that as a child I may want at one point to be an architect and now I'm transforming architecture even though I did not go into architecture at that point. Um, and being able to really make change in space um, and transform spaces is one of my passions to be able to create artwork that is both um, colorful, bold, which is a lot of my influences for coming from the Dominican Republic um, and, and the environments that I grew up there, um, and also being able to transform places that are, have meaning towards that particular location. I love to be able to research, find out what is important there, why is this particular artwork should be going there, who lives there, how the life gets that wall, all of that good stuff, as well as like engaging people in various forms without, throughout the process. Sometimes the process of community, engaging the community is simply asking questions right at the beginning stages of, of, the, of the work and research. Uh, sometimes it's actually enjoying, having them draw and paint with me. Um, I love painting big, especially. It's just this amazing ability to create things have detail um, and just get lost in that, in that space. Um, be able to use um, mostly water-based mediums. I'm super interested also in learning how can murals become more environmentally friendly? How can we use better materials that are not harmful for the environment? There's companies that are actually coming up with paints, we were just talking about this a little earlier, that are uh, absorbing smog and, 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 and cleaning the air actually by contact with UV light. So I'm interested in working with companies like this and also thinking through like what are the problems as artists like scaling things up and like playing with tools and machines that can help maybe make that process easier for us. Um, what a lot of patterns so today I actually got to play a little bit with um, pattern, uh, the laser cutter and the fab lab which was a lot of fun and I use pattern as a way of, of really talking also in, in terms of what who we are as individuals and how we can represent various communities, various groups. This particular piece is actually, some of you may know, be familiar with that it might see on Main Street, this December installation that I did uh, to kind of welcome people back after, like in the, in the, in the fall, um, into that space and talking about re-entering the space that we are in and reconnecting. It's this whole idea around how we can use art to also help ourselves feel we are welcome back into an environment. We are connecting through that process. And engaging people in art making in various forms. I also did portraits of local, you know, residents, students, staff, faculty, all sorts of people, and they help add color to and patterns. Similarly to Lars, I love working with youth, and this is a project I did last year in Chelsea, working with um, my own community in Chelsea. Um, it's a big time of celebrations, and I think ultimately for me. Part of the social practice and painting big is being able to connect with people. In the studio, I'm by myself, working on my own, my little world, which I also need that balance. But being able to connect to other women of color that are also wanting to do this work and be able to share that knowledge and pass on the baton and have more women painting on the streets. I think that it's super important to me that that is happening in a field that feels that we need that camaraderie, we need that group. Um, just also for safety reasons as a female painting oh, yeah. um, in public space. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, this is what I do. This is my love, my passion. I am interested in, and very open on collaborating uh, this week with anyone who needs art <laughs> to scale, to play, and to project. I'm also very interested in um, thinking through like how can this um, idea be going beyond the one location.
sustainable communities. And so um, <laughs> this is how I started. <laughs> this was a midlife crisis. I was, uh, I was in tele a documentary television producer, and um, I decided that uh, I was no longer interested in making uh, eye candy, uh, because that's what it had become by the time uh, I, I came into this around 2000, 2001, 2000, I guess. And um, I somehow found my way to MIT and to Neil. And um, uh, I started working with Neil in 2000, 2000? I guess it was 2000 or 2001. And um, uh, I'm sorry, what? Right? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> exactly. And um, uh, I was working really more as a kind of a promoter of the kinds of research we did at the Media Lab. And I saw this course that Neil was teaching called How to Make Almost Anything, right? And I was like, would you mind if I just sort of sat in on this class, right? And so he allowed me uh, to take, or he, he gave me the opportunity to take the How to Make Almost Anything class. And it changed my life. And it put me on this path. And so uh, my first, my, my big project was to make a heart that would beat when, it's, when it was interested in me. So, you know, there were sensors in it so that if you came close to me, like around two feet, my heart would start to beat for you. And it just turned out there were some interesting little uh, uh, little things that would go on because it was a uh, it was a uh, a kind of a sensor that would um, respond more when you didn't have clothes on. So you know, it would really start to beat. Right? <laughs> anyway, it was, it was a very fun project, and it really opened the bo the, the black box of technology for me. And um, and at this point, um, we had just started to deploy Fab Lab. So uh, this is our first Fab Lab, one of the first Fab Labs that we deployed, I think maybe the second, in Ghana. And uh, I had learned through, uh, through Neil the class, the Boolean logic, basically, and how you could take two circles and put them together like this, and then you take a square, you know, and you turn it on its side, and then you merge it all together, and you have a heart. And it was a wonderful way to teach people, you know, kind of have, have these basic skills. And so this is a teacher at the vocational school in Ghana, you know, making his first heart. And hearts have become kind of my uh, my symbol of, of the of the network. So these were my mentors, and I think a few of them are in here, like Neil and Nadia. Um, but these are wonderful, gracious, very giving graduate students and technicians, and um, I owe them so much. Um, and uh, in 2009, we, we were doing so many of these, it was crazy. So we, we spun off the foundation. And really, the foundation's goal was to scale the network. It was like, you know, let's build Fab Labs and make this part a part of infrastructure around the world so that we can use it for business, for education, and for uh, social impact, right? And so, you know, now we've got more than 2,000 labs in 125 countries, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. A crazy number, and and still growing, still growing, which is wonderful. Um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with uh, uh, Fab, uh, with the Fab Academy, or the How to Make Almost Anything class, which Neil taught, and we repackaged it for the global community. This is turned now into Academy, the Academy of Anything. So we have a How to Grow Almost Anything. Um, uh, we have Fab Academy. We have the Fab Brick Academy, which is the intersection of biofabrication, digital fabrication, and art, I mean textiles and design, right, or fashion. And then we also have K-12 programs. We are reimagining uh, our K-12 programs right now. The COVID was very tough on the Fab Foundation, and we, you know, we made it, and we're still alive, but we are reimagining some of our programming, and so the K-12 programming, uh, even though this is free and online for teachers to use, I think we want to start to use it more as a research platform. Uh, we do, uh, we try to support these efforts that are coming out of the network. 
uh, that, that, that the network is interested in. So this is the Fast City Project mm -hmm. about community resilience. Um, we do a lot of humanitarian aid, setting up, setting up labs in places where kids can be safe, where people can learn new skills and create economic opportunity for themselves. Trying to convince, convince humanitarian aid organizations that it's not about the crisis, it's about the resilience of the community. And um, uh, trying to help figure out how we make businesses and economic opportunities. So, and we're now starting to somewhat, kind of like Lars was talking about, we're trying to get, we're starting to get into public policy a bit. Uh, but what we do is, a, a lot of what we do is around public-private partnerships. And um, we have worked really hard these last few years on uh, inclusion and equity. And uh, we had a wonderful session in Fab Academy uh, last week, I think it was last week, uh, and we, uh, we've been working with a group around the world uh, yeah. to think about this, to think about how do we make technology and how do we make Fab Labs inclusive and equitable. We are diverse, we are a very diverse community, but we are not necessarily equitable and not necessarily inclusive. And so this group is starting by having us all, each, each, each of the success stories, having those voices that we never hear talk about their successes and talk about their challenges. And um, this, we did this one little exercise, Beno Juarez from, uh, from Peru. Peru, I am all up there. Uh, <laughs> from Peru uh, said, oh, made us an exercise. He said, there were about 40 or 50 of us online. That we all had four colors of blocks. It was just a blank page. And he said, you've got two minutes, make something together. And I love the fact that in two minutes, they made a heart. And so. Fab all in, and uh, we really believe in this. We want to embed this in all of our work, and that's why I get up in the morning because of all of you. So thank you. Aww. points of different projects, and if you're curious, just talk to me over meals. Um, my intro to creative practice looked like this. Um, I went to product design school, and then I worked as a consultant for the government in India, um, living and working with craft communities throughout the country. Um, so I'd spend a month learning how to play work, or learning how to make terracotta pots, um, mm. and understanding what the issues were with communities, and um, doing what they call design and technical intervention to improve livelihood. Um, so this is um, a recording from glass gemstone makers. They produce the teeny tiny fake rhinestones you see in the costume jewelry. 
industry worldwide, um, some of the lowest paid box workers I know of. Um, and when I worked with them, our role was um, what can we do to make um, safer work conditions, better fuel usage, um, um, women's rights, because women were very much involved in making, but didn't enjoy the rights that their male counterparts did. Um, children who were sort of being asked to go to school by the government, but whose parents needed them to also work and carry on the tradition. How do you balance a worldview from the past with a lifestyle in the present? Um, so just sort of this, so I ended up um, forgetting about art and um, getting them insurance cards and uh, ration cards and voter IDs. And you know, that's a, that was my intro of creative practice is where um, what I do is actually a small shift in a reality for someone else and hopefully um, gets them to where they need to be. Um, Right now, um, the community I'm working with is the bangle making community. Glass in India um, is special because we're the only country that makes glass bangles. Those, those bracelets that go on your wrist. Um, and that is a group of people uh, whose livelihoods are in risk over the next decade. So um, I work with uh, the family group in UP of Uttar Pradesh. Uh, we're sort of building an expanded technical vocabulary. So each of these things is a glass bangle. The, the work does not look anything like a glass bangle. Um, we also procure architectural commissions for them so they can produce large scale work, which means making one of these will give them income for a whole month as opposed to having to struggle with every day. Um, and then I build studio style rigs that allow glass growers around the world, for example, in Seattle, um, so they can actually incorporate their ideas and techniques and sort of push the boundaries of what the artists in India could be. Um, so those are the types of things I do. Um, so I'm very interested in grassroots. I'm very interested in what is the smallest thing there is that I can change. Um, and very idealistically, I believe that if I can change the smallest thing, then it could potentially cascade into something that's meaningful. Um, and I know that's not always true, but in my head it is. So that's kind of how I operate. Um, so if I translate that into material terms, um, I'm sneaky, I line long corridors with turmeric or cocoa and people barely notice that but by the end of the end of the corridor, they're very hungry, or they've thought of a memory that never occurred to them in the 20 years of their life. Um, so I'm, I'm super interested in sort of triggering very specific moments um, by intervening in space. Um, more messy, I like making messes. Um, so then the gallery had the show, wall was really white, very pretty, and then people came and pulled their strings at the wall, and then by the end it looked like that. And, um, I got a few complaints. Uh, but I also feed people ingredients from my installations. So it's kind of fun. You get to drink like a hot chocolate turmeric drink, which is kind of cool. Um, I work with glass. My glass does not glass the things. So the glass I make is flexible. Um, you can bend it, poke it. Um, makes crackly sounds. Uh, it relies on the fact that it is going to break the more you touch it, and yet it will not be activated unless you touch it. So, the irony of human touch, if you will. Um, I make glass dresses. Someone asked me about this one thing. I make glass dresses. Um, I do wear them. I wear them to teach. It's a seminar. Um, I wear them for board meetings. I wear them uh, for art openings. I wear them on the street, and I get um, Google at and praise and stared at, and then have really awkward encounters with people who see their reflection in me and then want to come and touch me and then they're like, whoops, I just touched this brown woman's body and that's totally inappropriate. And then we end up having a very strange conversation. So um, uh, I like that my work makes that possible. Um, this is a collaboration with Swarovski. Um, it debuted at the Shen Project a few years ago. So I make a lot of responsive work. This one's more immediate than the last one. Um, I one saying, minute. Cool. I make glass that breathes. So, um, the way I think about it, um, an object that reflects you causes you to reflect upon yourself. Does that make sense? Um, and what happens if that object doesn't reflect you, but it actually um, responds to you? It, it behaves like a living being and shifts that. So these are um, just video documentation of uh, glass blobs that should not behave like they're alive, but they kind of do. Um, I make large panels of this and the walls. It's like you stand in front of a mirror, you look at yourself and everything and it starts to inflate and deflate and you jump about a foot back. Mm -hmm. um, I make creative work. Uh, I use this technique of uh, frameworking. 
and get communities together to build structures like this. I teach them how to weld glass and color today, and we end up making cool things. So I'm gonna do, and I think I am. Oh, I'm Hati Glass. Um, lightweight porous glass that I came up with, um, recipe book for it. Um, building a library, <laughs> um, it can grow plants. So this is where I am right now. So um, it's like Leica, but not Leica. And um, so far I've been able to grow barley, but that's as far as I've gone. And I don't even know how to quit this. I'm giving up. <laughs> Sorry, not a PowerPoint person. No. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. That was so amazing. And we have all these people in common, I think. Oh my gosh. She was okay, so into this. Oh my gosh. Yeah, Start yeah, yeah. That's what I call that. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to focus on one body of work. So I do film, photography, um, a whole bunch of stuff, background basically in food studies before food studies existed. And um, there's certain people that have really influenced my work these days. And Christina Sharp, who's written In the Wake on Blackness and Being, Sidia Hartman, who engages in a type of research that I like to call critical, that she calls critical fabulation, and I call my work a visual critical fabulation. Mm -hmm. the, we, the work of Amitav Ghosh, especially his most latest book called The Nutmeg's Curse and How We Listen to Non-Human Others. And I just kind of want to pour this over you and into and on top of you so maybe you can get a sense of who I am and what I'm trying to do. It's a very small piece of work, but that means the world to me. So food studies, public health, nutrition, PhD in plant sciences, looking at Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine, how we treat what we call type 2 diabetes, looking at ecological knowledge systems that aren't Western dominated, and just trying to see what knowledge and systems they have to offer from a healing and health perspective. And over the years, being in food studies, I, I would always come across this book called the Nimatnama, the Book of the Light. And it's a cookbook written from 1469 to 1500, published in 1505 um, by the son who murdered his father. That's a whole other conversation, right? So this is the Sultanate period, pre-Mogul, and the British Library holds two of these books written in Persian and in Urdu, some of the first times you see Urdu written. And there are 50 to 55 miniature paintings. And those paintings, when I saw them, so you read about the Book of Delights. If you do food studies, if you look at ancient recipes, old recipes, the Book of Delights always comes up and they talk about how the Sultan was so amazing and how the Sultan created a harem of 20,000 women, of Africans, of Asians, of Central Asians, of, of Turkish people, and he retired to this place and he engaged in archery and philosophical discussions and they made food and they made medicinals and plants and aphrodisiacs. So this book is all about that. So I wanted to reimagine that world with the Sultan deleted, canceled, and erased. And I wanted to imagine the life of those very cosmopolitan women and femmes before European colonization. And I because they're, they're represented from the pinkest of pink white to the blackest of black. So you have the world there. Who were they? What did their lives dream into? And I wanted to give myself permission to say, what, did, what will their lives dream into unbound, untethered? So I start with what, uh, what I call and insist to call the African Indian Ocean world. And I'm giving you all this information because I want to introduce the senses more and more into my work, smell, sound, taste, but I don't want to do a cooking show. I might end up doing a cooking show. I don't know, but I'm here to see what do I do? How do I incorporate it? I'm working with some scratch and sniff. Um, I'm working with some audio stuff around the tiles that I'm making, and I have a Kohler Arts residency from September to December, so I can make some of these things in 2D. So I'm doing some slip cash moves. Here's the African Indian Ocean world. Um, and each of these things, either imagery comes from the Book of Delights and or from miniature paintings from the Ottomans to the Turks. And the title of this work is called Undisciplined Pleasures, Vigilant Finds. And I pull from people like, again, 
Sadia Hartman, Christina Sharp. So these fans are engaged in this radical thing called communicating without a cell phone. Um, <laughs> they are, they are uh, 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 surrounded with um, clay, probably clay ovens that were used. Um, the, the three shiros, and again, I want to give you this information to see the imagery, to see the pattern work, to see what's happening. Um, there were three women historical figures, Queen Benfis, also the name of my mother, oh. no coincidence, um, Razia Sultan, a very famous Muslim woman ruler who was appointed to rule by her father. Um, she was usurped by her mother um, because the mother wanted a son to rule. She appointed an Indian of African descent to rule her military, and some say that was her, her, her fall. And then Wazero Abibaj. Um, Alan, do you see the German Luger? So this is an Ethiopian <laughs> freedom fighter, uh, 1940s Ethiopian woman freedom fighter who said we must take up arms, we must fight against Italian fascism. And I would invoke Audre Lorde and say sometimes the tools of the master are quite, um, uh, uh, we can use the tools of the master, we don't have to not use the tools of the master to unengage. So they're engaged in undisciplined pleasures, but when called to arms, they break the patterns of patriarchy, they fly beyond, they, they go to deal with injustices, and they break the patterns of patriarchy. In body two of the work, the women are now fully frontal, and they have weapons of mass destruction or weapons of mass creation, depending on what you call them. So I'm in the process of making these weapons of creation. Um, and so here they are, these are the prototypes. There's more prototypes. Um, and so, can I put smells on them? Can I make them evocative in some way? Um, can I do something with porcelain? Um, there's a, a shirt that I want to create that might be infused with spices that might have scratch and sniff, but what can I do with them? Do they, I mean, I, I want to be here and see and learn from folks who are deep in material cultures um, what we might do to add to this sensorium to make them more available. Way that's um, not gimmicky but provocative. Thank you. If you would like, and I invite you there just to stand up and uh, try to shake it out. Yeah, you can stretch it out. I don't need to do this. Okay, cool. I don't know when the time starts. I gotta get going. Uh, that didn't count? Okay, great, great. This is public service. Okay. Um, hey, who's me? <laughs> Great, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, okay. So, um, again, my name is Daniel Callahan. Uh, I've probably given this spiel to several of you out here. Uh, so, uh, apologies, just uh, pretend like it's the first time. Um, and so, my name is Daniel Callahan. I'm a multimedia artist. Um, I just say artist because it's very efficient. And I think in the course of being efficient, I'm going to just talk about one of my practices um, and sort of how it bleeds into the many other practices that I do. Uh, so, um, I use uh, the face as a canvas, and um, when we usually think of masks, we think of things that, that cover our face or hide our identity, um, or things that we've been wearing the past few years that protect us, or are, you know, uh, we believe, we hope they'll protect us. Um, but what I try to do is to use paint, um, and paint directly on the face to reveal things about people, so to sort of flip the notion of what a mask does. And, um, it is very much based on, on uh, traditions of body decoration that you find all over the world. Um, and um, I use it as a platform to learn more about myself, but also to connect with others. Uh, and so you'll see examples of when I mask other people and when I mask myself. Um, the three sort of core principles of masking is identity, communion, and change. Identity because uh, when I mask, I use this portion of our face here that really is sort of like the media center of our, of our body. Right. 
we're constantly giving and receiving uh, bits of information through our face. This is how we find out if we know each other. This is how we find out if we're healthy. This is how we find out the micro uh, sort of uh, emotions that we're feeling. And so it's this really busy space, and it's also imbued with a lot of political and social um, sort of baggage, I should say, right? So when we look at people's faces, we look at my face, we see a black man, what does that mean? There's so much baggage attached to that, and cultural uh, uh, sort of uh, meaning attached to that. Um, and so what I like to do is use paint to sort of play around with that, that sort of, um, uh, 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 I guess, social, uh, socioeconomic and um, uh, political language. So um, I did a, pro a project called uh, uh, Year of the Mask, where I started to incorporate this in other people's spaces. But I first started with, uh, well, it's really, really interesting thing where it's not, oh, OK. I first started with my face, uh, where I did Month of the Mask, where every day of the year, I uh, used my own face as a canvas and just sort of made these meditations. Um, and so it became a very sort of uh, spiritual practice for me. It was a way for me to understand and incorporate the experiences I've had and to create new experiences for other people. Um, and so that extended to um, me sharing this artwork with other people um, and involving other people into the process. And so I started doing masking workshops um, where I would sort of teach people my approach because everyone kind of knows how to do this um, innately. But um, I know there's several people from Mass Art, so uh, shout out to Mass Art. Um, I did a workshop there with students there and uh, walked them sort of through my um, approach and then they uh, uh, you know, did what they did. They're incredible art mm -hmm. students, and so they're able to really latch on. Um, along with uh, the workshops, I am now uh, creating an event called the Mask Ball. Um, this was something I was doing in California um, uh, way back when, and we, it was basically this big party. And we didn't want to do, we wanted, we wanted it to be a ball, we wanted it to be something grand, but we didn't want people coming sort of uh, with their faces covered, like uh, Victorian masks. Um, and so we decided to paint the mask on our faces. Um, and that was really where the masking began. And so it was this big party. So I'm hosting a party uh, in July at the Arnold Arboretum, which is this incredible magical tree garden. And we're gonna have um, everyone there get a chance to be masked. And we're, we're gonna have uh, basically a cultural celebration of communities of color. And so we'll have traditions from a wide variety of countries, uh, uh, peoples, etc. We have, um, just to name a few, we have Japanese taiko drumming, uh, Brazilian capoeira, we have um, uh, uh, fashion designer, um, African American fashion designer. Um, we also have uh, a African dance troupe, um, a black quartet, um, and uh, two Nibuk, uh, uh artists, as well as uh, folks from the Massachusetts tribe representing. And so the question is if we as people of color came together, what sort of um, uh, new origin story could we create for ourselves? Mainly because for many people of color, their origin stories have been denied them. Um, or have been um, uh, taken away from them in some, in some way. Um, and so, uh, again, my practice has led me to sort of reach out to the world. Where am I? One of them? Okay, cool. Um, also, not only to reach out, but to reach in. And so, um, I created a film called Come On In. It's about an artist losing his mind, and it's an autobiographic. Um, so, uh, <laughs> um, and so, uh, it, tell, it sort of tells a story that I went through in terms of me losing my ability to. Um, to sort of express myself through my, I guess, native uh, medium, which was music, and having to find a new way and masking being that way. But throughout the process, I really sort of had a crisis of my own, and so masking really, really turned into a therapeutic um, sort of uh, element for me. Um, and so uh, I'm now researching how masking can be incorporated as a intervention technique for folks dealing with trauma, because it is a um, nonverbal way of processing experience and also creating new experiences. Um, oftentimes, people who suffer trauma identify with that trauma, and it's through a radical sort of approach like this where you're literally changing the way that you look um, in order to, for you to create new stories about who you are to yourself and to other people. So that's uh, my stuff, and there's many more things I can talk about, but I'll talk to you in person. Thank you.
have seen so far. Um, the video is the video in there. It's not there. Yeah. Um, I was starting a little bit um, with a, a video of give you a little overview of, of my work, and then I will go into one part of it. Come on, put your name. Say it again. <laughs> what, what's your name? We can do we can do this for a while, right? My name is Helen Berg. <laughs> what's my name again? <laughs> you do yeah. I don't remember my name and I don't remember how to do this. <laughs> there we go. It's think a lot about um, art and impact, and I realize that, um, how can we measure that? Um, so I ran back to uh, the sewing sessions of my aunt, my grandmother, and my mother. And I realized, um, and lately I've been thinking a lot about that, whose shoulders am I standing on? Who are the people before me that I'm doing what I'm doing right now, that I'm privileged to do this? And I realized that the sewing sessions when I was a little girl sitting in the corner, that I actually was not that interested in the clothing itself, but I was interested in their relationships with each other, how they were talking to each other, what they were talking about. But then I realized that I actually could see their character in the way they were making. And that my aunt, who was the straight laced one, her haute couture was perfect. My other aunt, who really wanted that, have that amazing apple pie worn on the table. She's 100 right now. She still walks around with pins <laughs> in her seams. And I love that. <laughs> Understanding that clothing can give me an indication who I needed to be in this world. So I started to work with clothing as a metaphor to understand um, not only who I am, but in a sense of being kind of thinking about the dependency that we have and fall back in our culture, but I didn't know what my own desires were. So when I came to this country, uh, to Ithaca, New York, easy way of moving into this country in a way, um, but to really start understanding that I was an immigrant and that I never needed to look at two countries. I'm a 
in the middle of the ocean, I still have it. I don't belong there anymore, and I still don't totally belong here. So I look at that a lot, and I want to talk about well, this. One minute. Yeah. One well, minute. That went fast. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I am going to talk real fast about one project that made a total difference in my life. Just before COVID, I um, was told by a friend that I needed to take my sculptures back to the body. And I told her for two years, two years, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. Too afraid, too vulnerable. So what I did is I um, invited my family to do this with me. My daughter, her partner, my husband was taking the photographs in my living room. And I told the magazine that the photos would never be shown if I was not satisfied. This was the best weekend of my life. <laughs> I had an amazing two people and my, and my, um, my husband who are critical who ask me questions, who give, who really are pointing a few things out to me. And I really realized that the heritage and the sewing circle was right there in front of me. Thank you. because the word art scares me. I don't consider myself an artist, but maybe a craft person and a designer. And I do think that some of my work has created um, impacts that I'd like to talk about. So I'm gonna talk about um, three kind of sections of my work tonight. Uh, the first one is a museum installation uh, from back in 2017. And this, uh, the impact of this piece is really about helping um, people experience uh, the craft of uh, a set of women who worked uh, in the Tiffany Lighting Company um, picking out uh, the glass that was then fabricated into these beautiful lamps that you see both of them today. Um, we created using the same language of the kinds of templates and drawings they would have used an interactive table um, and then commissioned a fixture out completely out of white glass that uh, I've been obviously backlit with controllable um, LEDs. And it just made for this really wonderful, really tactile and, and embodied experience um, that helped people in a small way understand what it was like to uh, design a lamp and also understand how hard it is because they are basically all incredibly ugly and that's because there is a real craft skill that went into designing these lamps. <laughs> I also want to talk about uh, the impact that I think technology can bring in unlocking new and different kinds of making for people. Um, so this is a uh, initially a design project and eventually a startup from way back in 2013 um, that explored direct-to-garment printing mm -hmm. and parametric um, pattern generation, which I was really excited about because you could, um, you know, we used uh, Body measurements, but these days you could you could use uh, 3D scanning. My jeans made by 3D scanners back. Um, but uh, this was not actually the most impactful part of this work. The most impactful part of this work. Um, oh, and this is you know, behind the scenes. This is how you lay down the pattern pieces in two dimensions, and then we actually saw an example of direct to fabric printing in the last presentation, which is the same process. Um, but the really great thing is actually all of the people that it unlocked to express mm -hmm. their art, their um, aesthetic preferences directly in their clothing. Um, so, you know, we, we didn't have a real business for a little while to sold this stuff, but what really happened was a ton of digital making and a ton of digital expression. Um, 
that. Uh, it was really, really exciting to see just all of the wonderful material that people freely uploaded, you know, to our site with very uh, uh, upfront and, and permissive policies for sharing information. And then the third kind <laughs> of impact I want to talk about is uh, togetherness. So this is some more recent work from the past couple of years, um, exploring how we can transmit our realities to each other. Um, so like a lot of other people, I was suddenly uh, sent to work from a, a corner of my studio apartment, and uh, that made me just really sad. Uh, I have mostly been working with faculty and architecture, uh, and spaces, and suddenly I was confined to just one space that was free of everyone except for my partner. Um, and <laughs> I love that it was not quite the same as being around a mul multiplicity of people. Um, so I started using things like virtual reality, um, spatial audio, uh, and um, WebRTC to both recreate spaces, imagine new ones, um, and share experiences and objects with other people. Um, so uh, some of this stuff we can play around with while we're here if anyone is interested. Uh, making augmented reality filters for things like um, Instagram and Snapchat are incredibly easy, especially if you have any 3D background at all, which I know almost everybody here does. Um, virtual reality has gotten better and better, and I uh, just actually find some deep human connection there. Um, and 3D scanning is also uh, something you can add to your system shocking to me as a person who did uh, photogrammetry in uh, large museum settings for so many years. Um, so yeah, I'm excited about our future of being together, even when the community is sort of choosing how to come out. Okay. My name is Franco Kostic Moskowitz. I'm originally from Croatia and I moved to the North Shore of Boston when I was 10 years old. I first got a job in a machine shop when I was 14. Uh, this is the first machine I ever worked on. And from 14 to 24, I worked in various prototyping and mechanical engineering firms, doing everything from making prototypes for jet foil, to parts for the lunar lander, to uh, things for Bosch and DeWalt. It's kind of hard to talk about. A lot of it is under some strict NDA. Um, but I can show you, uh, this is the first machine uh, that I ever built. Uh, I did dabble in some custom frame building in the local frame building community over there. This is the first piece of jewelry I ever made when I started attending Mass Art. It is a Christmas light in a tomatillo. There's a little battery in the back, and if you took it into a plaza, you could maybe kind of see a little dim small light. <laughs> but I'm still very interested in moments like this. So no matter how much order and architecture and accuracy we try to impose upon our, our built environment, there's still moments like this where the fence just falls over and we have some mending to do, right? So if you look at it even closer, you can see that something reveals itself about the way that the rope is slung and the skill of the builder that actually went and tied it with a nice neat slow pitch right into the correct part of the rock. And this sort of haphazard intervention is what I really, really feel at home in. Right? Um, so this is a piece of work that I made in my time as undergrad. It's a sculpture that you can 
pick apart and wear, and there's an earrings on it, and a brooch, and some other stuff. So after college, through some unforeseen circumstances, I sort of found myself at Corn Labs, and I found myself there very early on in the company's history, and I campaigned for something that wasn't a makerspace, but it wasn't a machine shop, but we needed to make stuff, and it was really frustrating because I was sort of putting all these strings and people together, and we were prototyping very quickly, and eventually I got, somehow, they said I could build a machine shop, a prototyping shop, so. After two or three years of, you know, shaking the meetings and saying that we needed and they wanted, and they let me design the space, and we built it over, 2019 and 2020, and it opened about a year and a half ago. And this is what that space looks like today. If I can play a video. So it felt really incredible to have that amount of work culminate in a space where people were in it and they were using it, and my time in engineering and my time in art sort of came together because I had picked up all these skills as a kid, and I picked up all this, I don't know, sort of, you know, weird art stuff. Just the ability to say that I didn't really know what I was doing, and that we had to work really, really fast. So really what I learned over this whole time was how to learn anything really quickly and how to do something well enough the first time that it's passable. <laughs> so this is on uh, the low fidelity side of the shop. We make all sorts of really fast things. We make repositionable sensors. Um, we make on the high, high fidelity side, we make full CNC machine prototypes that are accurate to plus or minus 10 microns of parts. Um, on the side, we also supply the shop with instruments and tools. This is a squareness comparator, which lets you measure the perpendicularity of the parts really, really accurately, and that's all machined by me in the house on that photo track. Uh, we also have teaching projects. This is a screwdriver, a ratcheting screwdriver that's made of all manually machined parts with a 3D printed handle, and there's a packet that guides you through every step of the process, and we have over 200 people go through that intro to machining project at Corn Labs. Mm -hmm. uh, this is just a video of it ratcheting. I don't know if it's going to load quick enough. Like it. Click, click, click. You can do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so I think that any space, especially at a private company, really owes it to the community to actually show up. Uh, the company doesn't end at the door, right? Um, so I try to do as much of that as I can without getting fired. Um, there, this is a, a picture of some work from a, uh, some outreach we did for BTS. Uh, we also uh, have high schoolers there for um, hackathons. We have uh, internships from local vocational schools. Uh, we have an artist residency that we're trying to kick off, actually. We had one this morning, but uh, sort of in the pilot program. Um, yeah. And then sometimes I do integrate everything, and this is a commission for a fashion company where I actually use a lot of 3D printed molds and accessories and tools like CNC machines to build this part, even though it's made with some serious hardcore metal smithing skills as well. I brace it all together, I set all the stones, I move the hinge. And sometimes I'm able to still kind of piece together and live in those moments where there are a little bit more haphazard things going on. So this is some jewelry that I've been making recently. Uh, these are some earrings from my best friend, who's a pre-paid teacher, so they look really rug rats. And this is the last one I made at Haystack. And thank you, thank you. First, nine o'clock sharp morning meeting. Um, and I've been to many evenings of these talks with no right ordering, but this 
was my favorite. They were all amazing. <laughs>